What's up, my healthy friends? Thanks for dropping into today's podcast episode, which is one that I'm particularly excited to bring to you because, well, let me get to that in a second, because in 2024, it's my mission to coach 500 people to get control of their sugar cravings, sugar binges, and the reason for that is so they can stop yo-yo dieting, stop obsessing about food, and finally create a body that they feel confident being in. And if you want to do that, then you know where to find those links. You can submit an inquiry via my website or go directly to the show notes here. Click the link and chat with me about whether or not you're a good fit for our program. Okay, sitting here with me right now is a megastar of the health, nutrition, and medical world. And in a way that she doesn't even know, she's a luminary that I look up to and has been a bit of a mentor and a guiding light for me over the last 10 years of my life. And so I'm very proud to be able to welcome and introduce Dr. Kate Shanahan to the How to Not Get Sick and Die podcast and to you. Kate is a Cornell University trained physician and scientist whose work have inspired entire movements involving bone broth, fermented foods, and seed oil-free business empires. Kate has been raising awareness about the harms of vegetable oil since 2002. Now, if you've ever been a client of mine, you're probably already starting to pick up on why I, why I am such a Catherine Shanahan fanboy over here. <laughs> now, together with the NBA legend, Gary Vitti, she created the LA Lakers Pro Nutrition Program, and she's also the author of some profound books, Deep Nutrition, which I have in my hot little hands here, The Fat Burn Fix, and recently, which I quite literally finished this morning, Dark Calories. And I'm super excited for you to be here, Kate. So welcome to the podcast. How are you? How are you? Well, I feel great now. Thank you for that um, uh, uh, head inflating introduction. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, your book, Deep Nutrition, that I found, as I was sort of saying before we hit record, yeah, over 10 years ago, literally changed my life um, because I was in the medical industry, in the cancer business. Um, and sure, I was you know, in the early phases of my career, so I was nobody meaningful or important. And, <laughs> but, but that book really just opened my eyes to, I guess, other possibilities. And it was, so, it was a situation where other people that were talking about this were often regarded as you know, hippie nutritionists or hippie naturopaths. And I was sort of captivated because I was like, oh, a medical doctor is talking about this stuff. Yeah, it was a while back before um, the, a lot of things have changed in the past like 14 or so years, you know, I would say somewhat for the better in terms of just the, the there is now a, so many more people talking about this, at least online, maybe not in universities and medical schools. But I hope that this next book that we're going to talk about dark calories can change that I seriously do hope. Yeah, well, that was a fantastic book. And like I said, I f literally finished it this morning. Um, and like we've, I guess, maybe coming up to 400 episodes of this podcast, and I've been banging on about how biologically devastating vegetable oils can be for a while now. Um, and so to have you here on the show, it's kind of like royalty of the message that I've been trying to share, which you taught me. Um, and so the interesting thing that I wanted to start with is that over the last few years, and I'm, I'm sure you've been privy to this as well, there's some well-known health experts on Instagram and online that have started doing backflips and saying that vegetable oils are not as bad as we original, originally thought. But I'm really eager to know from you, why do you think some people say that the idea of vegetable oils being so biologically devastating, why do, why do you think that's overblown or that they think it's overblown? Yeah, I, I think that they think it's overblown because they don't know, they, they simply don't know the history of it, which is these oils are only in our food supply because they were promoted as healthy. They were promoted as the antidote to heart attacks. And so they don't know that background. So they don't know that the, that changes the whole conversation because since it started so long ago, it, this whole idea that they were heart healthy originates from the late 1940s. Um, and so that's given the folks who want to promote them as healthy, quite a running start in terms of their ability to basically generate fake science that has become grandfathered in as beyond questioning. And, yeah. and so they, well, they don't understand that they don't, they're not looking at the right science. They're looking at the science that basically stems from this comes from these same people who are uh, you know, in many cases, it's literally from the American Heart Association, which is the source of the problem in the first place. And I talk about that story. We'll probably get into that. But 
um, you know, much of the research that these, I call them the debunkers, um, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, So these, the debunkers who basically say that seed oils aren't so healthy, or maybe they're, you know, maybe they're actually healthy, maybe they're not as healthy, not as unhealthy, you know, but it's, it's all overblown. That's what the debunkers are saying. It's just a big web meme, right? That's what they're saying. And then they look at the standard research, which is what doctors learn, right? Which is what, you know, is based on all of our teaching that we hear in medical school uh, that, that makes us, leads us to believe that cholesterol clogs arteries, all of that is what they're looking at. So they're not looking at anything new. They're looking and maybe the research, the particular studies that they're citing are new, but it all originates and cites back to some of these older studies. And the studies are flawed in one reason or for one reason or another. Um, like the, the brand new studies that, that are done are flawed. But the vast majority of the conversation uh, the meaningful part of the conversation took place in the fifties and sixties, and they just have no clue about any of that. Yeah. And, and I think when people start talking about financial deals between some of these companies um, and organizations, a lot of people start checking out of the conversation because they're like, Oh, here we go. A conspiracy theorist. I know. And I don't understand that because like that happened with cigarettes that ha- you know, doctors were promoting cigarettes and, uh, <laughs> The, it took us very long time for doctors to stop doing that and then to say, oh, wait a second, they're actually causing problems. Um, and I also, I don't understand it because it seems like when you say that about sugar, you know, there was an expose uh, between Harvard, uh, you know, and the sugar industry that promoted sugar as healthy. And that's what led to a lot of the low fat. And And nobody like says that's a big conspiracy. Like that's, checks all the legit boxes um, in their minds. Well, this should too, because this is the same thing. It's just that instead of just one or two researchers that were bought and sold by the sugar industry, this was an entire organization, the American Heart Association, that was bought and sold by the vegetable oil industry. It's very analogous. Um, It's very sad and tragic and perhaps even more, I argue it's more tragic, but it's as legit as the sugar thing. So Seems like if you're going to call that a conspiracy, then you should call, you know, sugar healthy. Go back to that. I'm curious to go into that conversation because um, a few people have heard us sort of refer to it or mention it a couple of times in regards to that relationship with the American Heart Association. Um, So I'm curious if you can just sort of explain that financial relationship uh, many decades ago and how that's impacted the relationship that we have as consumers on our perception of nutrition and vegetable oils. Yeah, so this is a story that I've been wanting to tell for years. So Dark Calories tells the story here of the, the really what this is is the biggest fraud ever perpetrated on the American population, and now it's spread to the global, the globe. So it's a global population, um, and the story originates back in the 1940s, late 1940s. 1948 was the year where um, the American Heart Association which is an organization of medical doctors who are supposedly interested in finding the cause of heart attacks and all heart diseases and preventing them. So back in 1948, they accepted money from Procter & Gamble, which sold soy oil and cottonseed oil and products made with them. And they accepted a $1.75 million donation, right? Just a donation. Um, which is, which at, at that time was pre many iterations of inflation. Yeah, so uh, the calculations It's a lot of money. The calculations now it's uh, about 30 million dollars. So it's a, it's a pile of yeah. cash. And so uh you know, what do you know within about t- 10 years they started you know promoting actually it was less than 10 years that they started um like doing the first signals of these oils are heart healthy. Um saturated fat is causing heart attacks. Now, the term saturated and polyunsaturated, um, maybe you've talked about that before, but that's, that was actually uh, became common language in the 50s and 60s. You know, now it's kind of gone dormant again. But n- newspaper um, ads and magazine ads were using the term polyunsaturate as a selling point to sell the vegetable oils. And, you know, so, so that it went straight from the American Heart Association to promoting it to the magazine ads, 
there was a book that the American Heart Association put out promoting these oils called The Prudent Diet that sold millions of copies. It was a blockbuster, one of the first, if not the first and the biggest blockbuster diet book promoting these oils and telling people to avoid butter. Um, and so, you know, that was done after they accepted money and it started before they had done any research. There was not a shred of evidence anywhere in the medical literature to support that. And so that's like step one of this big fraud. And it gets worse because step two was to take that big pile of cash equivalent to $30 million today and start doing scare quotes research to support the theory, right? This was a medical organization, a group of professionals, and they had the means, they had the money, um, and they had the connections to do major, large studies that, according to some people at the time, supported the theory. Who? The biggest one was Ansel Keys, the biggest, most famous person. But according to many other people at the time, proved nothing. And one of the, you know, the most famous folks uh, involved in what became the Framingham studies, which are, which are a very big, large, expensive series of studies in, done in Framingham, Massachusetts, that the American Heart Association points to support their, to support their theory. Um, there was a doctor named George Mann who organized the nutrition arm of the study and he led it and he analyzed all the data. He knew more about it than anybody else. And he says, after 20 years and millions of dollars, we've proved nothing. We have not proven the relationship. <laughs> Basically, there doesn't seem to be one. Um, you know, and so the American Heart Association claims that they have evidence, but it's only because they can get away with essentially lying. And there's no other word for it. I know it sounds like, oh yeah, conspiracy. It's to me, it's a, it, and there's no better word for it. It's a lie. They say that they have evidence when they don't have evidence. And I break down some stories in the book, um, chapter five of Dark Calories. It was just really shocking, the attitudes of Ansel Keys and um, you know the, the attitude that he had towards people who were overweight. Um, it, it, he went into the whole science of nutrition with the preconceived notion that people who had weight problems and health problems, it was their own fault. They didn't have willpower. Yeah, it was funny listening to that chapter, um, the Ansel Keys chapter, because at some point I imagined the two of you with boxing gloves on in a ring. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, I was just thinking, oh, yeah, I'm loving this chapter because I've talked about that a little bit over time as well. But one of the interesting things that pops up in my mind for in regards to that conversation about, you know, it, you know maybe it sounds a little bit conspir conspiratorial, is you, you put an example in the book a little later on, which sort of totally removes that any suspicion at all, which is that some of these bottles actually have on them, like that the hold the vegetable oil that we sell in the supermarkets, have disclaimers on them that say from the FDA that say that there's not very much evidence to support the use of these for, for health. Right. Yeah. I mean, like it's insane that the bottles themselves made by a huge industry have a more honest it take on the cholesterol theory than the top minds in cardiology at the top universities and institutions around the world. Yeah. And they sum it up <laughs> in just confronting. a few sentences, you know, well, we don't really have any evidence. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. But enjoy your toxic sludge. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Right. Yeah. It's and that, that theory on cholesterol, what is it and why is it wrong? So um, the theory on cholesterol states that cholesterol damages your arteries. Um, now, I think it's important. Uh, so the cholesterol damages your arteries and ar arterial damage leads to heart attacks. Mm -hmm. But this theory has taken several forms. And before it was what I just said, it was a little different. They keep changing it and tweaking it. To, to, to make it seem less like a lie and more like consistent with the very basic physiology that we keep learning. So, so back when it first started, this man, Ansel Keys, who was an oceanographer, not a human physiologist, not an MD, 
um, Ansel Keys, and he is the father of the diet heart hypothesis. He's the big bad guy that I was boxing with <laughs> in chapter <laughs> five, post post mortem, um, in his case. And, and um, Ansel Keys, when he first started talking about why fat was unhealthy, you know, based because he had this preconceived idea, fat is an indulgence and we shouldn't eat it. Um, but so when he first started talking about it, he focused on a type of fat called saturated fat, which is uh, imparts a solidity to the fats, which is why butter is solid on the counter and oil is liquid and even stays liquid in the fridge. Um, so because uh, oil has very few saturated fats. So his idea, his big genius idea, not genius at all, was that, well, gosh, that's what happens in our arteries. And he literally said, it clogs up just like grease under the pipe and, you know, you know, in the pipe under your kitchen sink. Um, now that's not how the body works. Um, and, and it, he didn't know at the time, that's not how the body worked. He didn't know about these little things that carry fat in our blood so that it doesn't clog up called lipoproteins. He, he just didn't know about them. But, um, so when he, as soon as he learned about them, these lipoproteins, they carry, they have a lot of cholesterol in them. And when we measure blood cholesterol, we're measuring particles that we that are, that are HDL, stands for high density lipoprotein, um, LDL, low density lipoprotein. These all have cholesterol in them. And when you have more of these particles in your blood, you'll have more cholesterol in your blood. Well, when you have more fat in your diet, saturated fat especially, you need more of these particles to carry it around. So you have more cholesterol in your blood. So that's how he modified it. He said, oh, okay, all right, fine. So, uh, so butter is unhealthy because it raises cholesterol carrying particles. And, you know, gosh darn it, if we don't see some cholesterol in atherosclerotic plaques, right? Um, and, and then uh, it, it, the theory just keeps getting more and more complicated. But so, uh, uh, so way back in 20, I'm sorry, in 1919, um, cholesterol experiments were done to, in, in rabbits where they, um, also were able to see cholesterol in arteries, right? So he just linked these, these two ideas. Um, okay. I see fat raises your lipoproteins and lipoproteins have cholesterol. And then these other earlier experiments were done where they injected rabbits with oxidized cholesterol. And then it damaged their arteries and there was some cholesterol that they found there. They never realized it was oxidized at the time, neither did Ansel Keys. So he put those two ideas together and said, okay, so saturated fat raises cholesterol and that's what gives you heart attacks. And then he got all these big genius guy awards, was on the cover, cover of Time Magazine, you know, because it supports the whole, he was part of the American Heart Association. He was a leader in the American Heart Association and he was the beneficiary of a lot of that money that Procter & Gamble um, donated to the American Heart Association. So, um, you know, his preconceived idea just worked out to be in alignment, right? So there's no, it's not like he got directly paid. It was just, he had, he was a man on a mission. Um, the mission was to get attention and arrows pointed at Ansel Keys being the guy who solved the terror of heart attacks that were truly terrorizing the country at the time because nobody knew what was causing them. So, um, yeah. So did I answer the question? I feel like I went on for a while. <laughs> no, you totally did. You totally okay. did. Well, and, and I think as well, some people assume for whatever reason, or maybe there's a default assumption built into our society that medical and health professionals are just these angels that are here to help. And as if they don't have an ego, mm -hmm. um, cause that's what you're sort of describing, right? Is Ansel Keys was in pursuit of validating his own ego. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. I mean, you know, he, um, he was a devoted researcher, and what's good about him was he did have the idea that not every doctor shared, which was that diet matters, and your health isn't some kind of preordained thing that either you're born with it or the stars had to align to be healthy, you know, that kind of thing. Um, uh, because, you know, there were some doctors who just didn't even bother thinking at all, and they said, well, it's all <laughs> random, right? And so he was fighting against those. But he was, you know, he was, so he was better than the absolute boneheads. But he wasn't, you know, he did not have his heart in the right place. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I often say as well that the, like, in comparatively, the vegans and the carnivores, we're all trying to achieve the same thing. Yeah. Um, but I think this is a perfect example of 
you know, in the beginning, it's like, yeah, we all want everybody to get healthy. But after half a century of that information, the divide between the two groups of, you know, cholesterol and, you know, cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease and cholesterol does cause heart disease. Now, decades later, it's like in the beginning, sure, we we had it a little bit wrong. And now it's like everybody's got heart disease. So that little bit of information that we went in the wrong direction with, ended up causing a, you know, an absolute tidal wave of some of the issues you were trying to prevent. Absolutely. And sadly, they keep modifying the theory and making it more complicated uh, you know, and, and adding like more bells and whistles to it and more terms and stuff like that. So, so now it's, it's cholesterol is a problem because small, dense cholesterol particles uh, which enter the, they're small, they enter the bloodstream and then they oxidize. It's the wrong order. But like, so that was a theory for a long time. And, you know, so now at least they're getting the term oxidation in there, but they're getting it in the wrong order. And that little bit of, of detail wrong is making all the difference. If they would just acknowledge that it's the polyunsaturates that oxidize as these things are ferried around in the bloodstream, that is the first source of the problem. And then those particles are oxidized and they don't work right. They start building up in your arteries. They, they cause inflammation, but they're getting it the order wrong. And, and this is what I wanted to do in, um, with chapter two of Dark Calories is get the order right and focus, turn our focus away from cholesterol and other things like I mentioned as a root cause where doctors are sort of like, oh, there's a whole bunch of things or, well, we don't really know, or it's genetic or, you know, like doctors don't, we're not born with the knowledge of what is a root cause, but we do hear about a lot of potential root causes. Um, But all of them point towards oxidative stress. That's pretty clear in all of the literature that I have ever reviewed. Um, Oxidative stress causes inflammation. It causes genetic problems. It causes cancer. It causes um, brain uh, cells to degenerate and it can cause dementia. It can cause neurolo- any neurologic disorder. Everywhere you look for the root cause of any disease, you see oxidative stress. And the, the substance in the food supply that promotes oxidative stress more powerfully than all the rest is the vegetable oils. And so that's why this conversation is so important. And, and it's because it can simplify everything. So we don't have to think about, um, you know, small, dense particles. We would just focus on oxidation. And when we do that, we realize, gosh, those small, dense particles are oxidized LDL particles. And then the, we can ask the question is, okay, well, when do they really oxidize? Is it after they get into the the um do they the particles oxidize after they get into our arteries or are they oxidizing before as they're circulating in our bloodstream and when we look for where does the oxidation happen the answer is very clear that it's as they're circulating in the bloodstream and you can't do that you can't have them oxidize efficiently at all when you're doing experiments unless you've included polyunsaturates and and not just polyunsaturates, but specifically vegetable oils. It really is a difference between polyunsaturates and how they affect our health when they're coming from whole foods and polyunsaturates in vegetable oils when they come laced with toxins and it's a very different delivery system. I'm curious to go into that, um, the toxins and the processing of vegetable oils, because Obviously, so much damage is done to those molecules in that process. So I'm wondering if you could just sort of share a bit of an overview, which you do in both deep nutrition and, and dark calories, of the processing of vegetable oils and why they become so toxic. Yeah, this is very important, Maddie. And I don't know if you've noticed lately, but there's a lot of folks who are talking about vegetable oils and they're focusing not on oxidation, but on omega-6 fatty acid called linoleic acid. Have you noticed that? Yeah, I've I've heard that a lot lately, yeah. Yeah, they've kind of taken over the conversation a little bit and that's a problem because that's wrong and it's another reason when you asked earlier, why are there all these debunkers? The debunkers aren't pointing to my science. They're pointing to these people who are talking about linoleic acid and omega-6, right? Mm -hmm. Because they are wrong. So their wrongness... um, uh, just to, to state this, 
They're saying linoleic acid, which is a polyunsaturated fatty acid that our bodies need, that is high in seed oils. It's also high in seeds. Um, and it's high in a variety of foods that occur naturally. They're saying linoleic acid is equally toxic um, to vegetable oil. And it, and it doesn't matter where it came from. It, it, it's just you need to avoid linoleic acid because it has toxic effects um, itself, which is not true. Um, and so um, this is, I'm bringing this up, Maddie, because um, a lot of people might leave this conversation and run into the folks talking about omega-6 linoleic acid because they've just gotten a lot more, uh, it's spread around a lot easier because it's a much simpler thing. It's just pointing to yeah. one thing. Oxidation, oxidative stress, these are words that make people's eyes cross. Sometimes when I'm thinking through this, like I, I feel like a, you know, I, I lose the train of thought very easily. It's hard. It's complicated. It's not as simple as just say, oh, just don't. Uh, now we have to worry about linoleic acid and omega-6. Just, that's just the one thing. Like that's the thing that they say is the cause of everything. No, mm -hmm. it's not the cause of everything. It's oxidation is actually the cause of everything. But oxidation is harder to understand. Right. I mean, if, if you're not yeah. a chemist, if you're not like yourself, you probably have a quite a background in organic chemistry and you know how to draw a polyunsaturate probably. Um, mm -hmm. But if you don't, then these are all abstract terms. But to chemists, they're concrete and, and we can see the connections. But most of the people talking about linoleic acid just are not and cannot and are wrong. And they're, they're veering this conversation down a dead end that, um, that you and I need to turn around and get down the right road. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it makes me think about what you've said um, in both, but all the books and content of yours that I've consumed is that the conversation has not been with lipid scientists. Right. Like it, we're not even talking to people that are experts in fat, at, like to be able to even understand this concept. We're talking to other people, cardiologists, medical doctors, nutritionists, dietitians, who are not lipid scientists when the conversation is about lipid science. Yes, that's right. And um, it's insane that they don't invite food scientists into the room when they're talking about food, but food, but they don't. But you know what? It's not just one group of lipid scientists because it's not just in the factory that, um, that these things can form toxins. And it's not just in the frying pan. It's also in our digestive tract, in our bloodstream, and in every single different type of tissue in our body. And there's long-term effects and short-term effects. And it's mind-boggling, which is why it's taken me 20 years to get this far. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, so the thing is that um, you need to put it all together into one story to truly see the big picture of the fact that these things are the most harmful things in the food supply, but you can't just look at the processing. And I want to answer your question about that. I haven't forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't just look at what happens in the frying pan. Uh, and you, you can't just look at what happens in the bloodstream or the liver or the body fat. You have to consider all of these things as well as how the body adapts to all this. It's, the body is a dynamic system. And as it is being poisoned, adaptations happen that change our appetites. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that uh, as a you know, biologist fundamentally, I, have, I carry the belief that nature doesn't make mistakes and that all, all disease is compensatory to a toxic environment. Right. Exactly. I 100% agree. That, I mean, nature, if nature does make a mistake, it's one natural kind of thing being damaging to the other. And that has happened less and less as our amazing planet has become more balanced. I don't mm -hmm. know if you want to go down this rabbit hole about oxygen. <laughs> I, um, I love rabbit holes. I, I often joke that this podcast should be called Maddie Ruins Everything. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's what I would probably name my podcast too. So, um, <laughs> with rabbit holes, but this is such an, an interesting and fascinating rabbit hole. And it's totally pertinent to the conversation, believe it or not, about, um, metabolism because, um, oxygen is basically the fuel that runs everything in our metabolism. It gives us energy. And the history of oxygen is, um, getting to the point of nature doesn't make mistakes. Um, you could almost say this was a mistake that almost killed all of us. But fortunately, 
uh, was really bad for a lot of organisms on Earth. When oxygen levels increased in the atmosphere, 99% of life died, they estimate. And why did oxygen levels increase? Well, because one little life form, uh, or maybe two or three, started excreting oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis, right? They started using um, uh, the UV light uh, as energy, UV light plus glucose, and uh, released oxygen into the atmosphere. And the levels increased to, you know, hundreds or thousands of times of what they were. They were basically nil at the beginning of life on Earth. And so after a billion years or so, levels increased. And in all, in all of the oceans, all of life had polyunsaturated fatty acids in its membranes. And those were attacked by oxygen and things started dying left and right and almost everything died. Now, so just because you said nature doesn't make mistakes, nature fortunately on this planet has not made fatal mistakes. And I don't even know if that was a mistake. That was very, that was a good kind of outcome because without that, without oxygen, there would be no life as we know it. Oxygen mm -hmm. powers all life forms beyond the single cell. You can't get enough energy going without oxygen to have anything other than something the size of a teeny tiny bacteria. So, yeah, I love that you also added in there UV light. And that's particularly interesting being in Australia myself <laughs> because our government puts such an effort into scaring us away from the sun. <laughs> right, of course. Yes, naturally, yeah. Yeah, heaven forbid you ever get a tan. Um, but um, right, so so that because of UV light, we have oxygen. And because of mm -hmm. oxygen, the next invention that saved life on Earth, and this pertains to, we need them now, are antioxidant enzymes, antioxidant compounds, and antioxidant enzymes. These are systems, complex systems that work together to trap high energy molecules made mostly from oxygen. There's others, but most of them come from oxygen. Um, and they saved the cell membranes of those ancient bacteria. They saved the polyunsaturated fatty acids. And by saving that, they saved the cell membranes. Um, and so that applies today because what happens when we eat too much vegetable oil is uh, because of you know, the toxicity of it that we still need to get into what happens in the factory. <laughs> but what happens when you eat them is what happens in your body is they, one of the first insults is that they start depleting your, um, your antioxidants, not just things like vitamin E, but everything involved in fighting oxidation in the body. And uh, that includes things like glutathione and it can affect vitamin C levels and many of the cofactors and the enzymes. And you just lose your ability to control oxygen in all of your cell membranes. And that's the root cause. So, I mean, that's the root cause of oxidative stress, right? The loss mm -hmm. of antioxidants combined with the onslaught of these toxins that start forming in the factory. And I assume when we're talking antioxidants, we're talking the ones that we extract from food as part of our diet, of which that concentration has reduced the more sugary, the more produced, the more vegetable oil we've got in the food system. Our intake of antioxidants is depleting along with soil degradation and the lack of bioavailability of nutrients in the soil that the plants are grown. Right. We're, we're getting hit from all angles. Yes. And, but the most powerful is the processed food. So that's what all processed ingredients have in common. So vegetable oil is the worst of the worst, but absolutely sugar has mm -hmm. no antioxidants, no nutrition. It's empty calories. Um, and, and refined flour, white flour is really not any better than sugar. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then even protein powders, I'm not a big fan of those for similar reasons. They, oh, I've got that in my notes to talk about. Stripped. Yes. It's so yeah, interesting. Stripped. So, but the, there's that, so that's part of the story of how our bodies fight oxidation is the, these compounds that are stripped away from our food during processing. And, and ultimately mm -hmm. that is truly the reason why processed food is so unhealthy. No one's like saying that as simply as that, because it, oxidation is complicated and it's really not, you know, easy for anyone to understand. But, um, but uh, yeah, so that's the reason ultra processed food is bad. And I think everyone can agree ultra processed food or processed food. They're basically the same thing. Uh, they all have these similar ingredients, vegetable oils, flour, refined flours, sugar, and many of them have processed proteins. 
and they do not have the micronutrients and they do not have um, the antioxidants. But what are the real, what are the other antioxidants? I said that's just part of the story of how our bodies fight oxy oxygen and oxidative stress. So the real workhorses are enzymes, which are called antioxidant enzymes. They're, if you've never heard the term enzyme before, you're not familiar with it. An enzyme is like what makes everything in our cell go. It's like the, they're biological machines. Like when you talk about, um, well, maybe you've talked about uh, dopamine transporters, right? So that's, that's essentially an, an enzyme, right? It takes, it's a biological machine that takes dopamine from outside the cell and brings it back inside the cell, right? Other enzymes synthesize dopamine. Many steps are involved, but enzymes are very complicated things. Our bodies make them. And of all the enzymes that our bodies make, I think the most common, and I'm still looking into this, but I think it's a legitimate thing to say that the most common enzyme in our entire body are the collection of enzymes that fight oxidation, the antioxidant enzymes. Gotcha. Makes sense with the, is such a massive increase in oxidative stress in the modern food environment. Well, I think this is just how evolution actually did this. Our, our, oh. um, yeah. So this is part of how we survived. It wasn't only antioxidants like vitamin E and other compounds that were put in our, in the ancient bacterial cell membranes. It was also enzymes that started helping these compounds work together. And that's key. Because vitamin E alone does nothing to fortify your body against oxidative stress. It mm -hmm. must work. It works in concert. And I have a picture of how it works in concert with vitamin C and glutathione and um, uh, you know, glutathione oxidase and reductase. And you know, that means there's so many enzymes involved in just handling free radicals that form in membranes. But free radicals can form all over the place. So you need different antioxidants for that, different sets of enzymes, and so on. So the enzymes are actually the real powerhouses of how our bodies fight antioxidants. And they're the, unders, the unders, unsung heroes, really, because we hear all the time, oh, just supplement with you know, vitamin E and vitamin C and whatever the, like resveratrol or goji berries or eat lots of blueberries. Most of those antioxidants that are not vitamins do nothing once they've been ingested into our bodies. Our liver has to eliminate most of them. They have no function. Mm -hmm. The vast mm -hmm. majority of the work of controlling oxygen and preventing oxidative stress from destroying our cells is done by these enzymes that our bodies make from scratch. And they just require a lot of nutrients to be around or they won't be manufactured. Mm, so we need, it's, it's less about consumption of the built molecule already. It's our right. capacity to build antioxidants that is important. Exactly. It, it's kind of like, you know, if you eat, you know, you want to build muscle and all you do is sit around all day, you never exercise. And you eat, you know, whey protein powder, but you don't eat any sort of vitamins or minerals or, you know, other nutrients that we need. You don't get the right fatty acids in your diet. Well, you're not going to build muscle sitting there on your couch. It's kind <laughs> of like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, we, you know, we need the whole picture. And, and the biggest part of the picture, you know, as with exercising, I'm sorry, as with muscle building, um, we have some key components here. We need to exercise. We need to eat protein. We also need hormones, right? So with, when it comes to fighting oxygen, some of the key things are, well, we need those enzymes. So we need, and those enzymes are made of protein. So we need to have a diet that has adequate protein. And the, a lot of the cofactors in those enzymes um, are minerals. So we need to have plenty of minerals in our diet. And that is something you can supplement and probably maybe need to. Um, and then mm -hmm. the other thing is we need to have all the vitamins. We need to have lots of vitamin E, lots of vitamin B, B. All the vitamins are involved. And those two are things that we can and maybe should supplement. Yeah, it's good to know, I guess. And I, I mean, I want to go in two directions here. I want to go, I want to talk about the protein powder because so many people ask me about protein powder. Um, but let's first go through the processing of the vegetable oil so we under, so that people that are, go to the supermarket today when they listen to this, they can understand why not buying the vegetable oils is a good idea. So 
Okay, so I mentioned that there's many steps along the way where we need to consider how vegetable oils promote oxidative stress, and it begins in the factory. Nothing else in the food supply is like vegetable oils in that they, um, you know, they, they, they were never created as food in the first place. So all of the vegetable oils have their origins, except for sunflower, all of them have the, their origins as industrial products, either things like machine oil or in the case of cottonseed, um, as um, soap and candles. Um, so that, that matters because when you are trying to make oil from something that has never been bred to have a lot of oil, um, it doesn't work very well. And uh, so like olive oil, for example, you can make a virgin olive oil by just putting olives under a stone press and you'll squeeze out olive oil. And that olive oil is edible and delicious. Mm -hmm. But it's not the case in the factory when they're making soil. You can't easily take um, you know, a bunch of soybeans and squeeze out and get any kind of oil because- Yeah, unlike, it's pretty difficult. <laughs> yeah, unlike olives, it was just never bred. To, to be that way. We've had soybeans in, 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 uh, throughout Asia for thousands of years, but they were never used for oil. They're not that oily. When you squeeze them, they don't yield that much oil. So the only way mm -hmm. to do it is heat, pressure, and often hexane, which is a solvent. Um, so when, you know, clearly when you use hexane, it's not edible. Um, what you know, the, the, it's not edible. The crude oil is not edible when you use hexane. Hexane is a solvent. It's in gasoline. It's a toxic material, hazardous material. So you, the only kind of seed oil that could even possibly be conceived to be edible is the tiny minority of it that's produced without the solvents. And they call that expeller pressed. They also call it organic. It's not really organic because as we're about to see, it contains toxins. So the crude oil that is, comes from soybeans that weren't used, the hexane when hexane wasn't used, um, is still not edible, right? Because of the heat and pressure. Um, and it, what, it, what you get in the end is a foul-smelling sludge that contains indigestible compounds and oxidized toxins already. That's why yeah. processing is required. You see, a lot of folks think that it's the processing that makes it to toxic. It's the heat and pressure of extraction and the fact that these things should never be used for oil that, that makes it toxic. And the refining cleans it up. Yeah. It makes you wonder when something has to be, it makes you wonder when something has to be flavored and colored right. and deodorized for consumption. What did it smell and taste like before? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So, so, um, so as they clean it up, um, the, in the factory with steps like degumming, deodorization, bleaching, de-waxing and so on, um, all of that makes it less toxic than it was, mm -hmm. but it cannot remove all of the toxins because part of the cleanup creates other new toxins, right? So it's just like at some point the, the factory, um, engineers, the chemical engineers who run the factories are like, well, this is the best as it's going to get. And so as they leave the, the factory, the bottles contain anywhere between 0 0.6 and 5.2% of unnatural trans fats, which is an entire category of uh, molecules, some of which are highly, highly toxic. And those are present in small concentrations. And, and here's the thing, here's why that matters. So first of all, if you just eat that, you're eating toxins, right? So even when it's organic sunflower oil, even when it's organic canola oil, organic soy oil, which there isn't very much of, um, it still contains toxins, small amounts. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Those small amounts of toxins, the toxins actually accelerate the destruction of more polyunsaturated fatty acids. They accelerate the reactions with oxygen when you cook with them, you know, in the frying pan or after even just after you open the bottle, oxygen in the air. And, and these toxins act as accelerants to increase the concentration of toxicity, even just in an opened bottle. And then, of course, if you're cooking with it, it's, it the accelerations are, are even more rapid 
Um, and then if you reheat something or the longer you cook it, you know, it, the more we're getting toxicity here. And so mm -hmm. if you want to say how much toxicity are we talking about and how serious are the toxins? Um, the answer is complicated because <laughs> there are three stages of, there are three humongous categories of toxins. There's what they call first order toxins. Then those toxins react again to, to create second order toxins. Then those react again to create third order toxins. And all of this happens in the oil and in our food. And it's going to be different depending on what food we're using. Oh mm -hmm. my God. <laughs> so it's extremely complicated. So when they test French fries, which um, are fairly simple in terms of their, the potato has fairly few nutrients, um, fairly few minerals. Minerals accelerate some of the toxin formation. Um, but the potato has very few. So the calculation of toxins in French fries is really, a lot of it just is really what the oil is doing, not the interaction mm -hmm. so much with the food. So what is, how much toxin is, a, is in a French fry? A fast food, average fast food French fry, a lot. So this is from research done by um, one of the lipid scientists who just studies uh, fried food, basically. Doesn't understand mm -hmm. digestion doesn't understand how these things affect, you know, downstream effects in the body. But he says that a, a five ounce serving of fries, which is a large serving of fries in America, <laughs> um, uh, has about 20 to 25 fries in it, has equivalent toxicity to a pack of cigarettes, which has about 20 cigarettes. So it's a one to one in terms of one French fry um, equals you just smoked an entire cigarette in terms of this category of toxins that he studies called the alpha beta unsaturated aldehydes, which are the worst toxins. There's others. Yeah. Wow. That's so yeah. One, one meal. And that's not even including the stuff that the burgers cooked in um, plus right. the sugar and, and additives that go in the soda and or milkshake that you might get. That's just the fries component of the meal. Correct. And so if you're having like a stir fry uh, in a different restaurant where you would have stir fried meat, well, mm -hmm. the iron in the meat that reacts more quickly than what's going on in French fries because there's more iron and there's more proteins, there's more nitrogens. Nitrogens are also extraordinarily reactive. Potatoes don't have a lot of that stuff. So testing has not been done. The same, Dr. Grootfeld has not tested um, meats, at least not to my knowledge. I've not seen that he has. Um, and uh, nobody has. But I would imagine that you would create toxins much quicker in stir fried meats. At least they would be on the surface of the meat, right? So if you have tiny chopped up meat, like, you know, you're doing something like a ground beef. If you happen to be adding it, if you do lean ground beef and you add an oil, you're going to be getting some pretty toxic stuff by the time you're done cooking it. If you add a vegetable oil. Yeah. Because you mentioned cooking just there, it, it opens up that conversation, which is probably a huge frustration of yours, but definitely is of mine, is that you know, often when people go down the quote unquote health aisle of the supermarket, we, we know enough about sugar to, for people to start looking for oh, low sugar or less sugar, or, you know, in some cases, sugar replacements, and that opens a whole conversation, but we'll leave that for another day. Um, but just the idea that because people cook at home, they assume that what they're cooking is healthy because it's now home cooked, um, just, but they're also pouring canola oil into the pan. Um, and cooking, you know, the food, but also health products that are in bags and boxes and cans that have got really nice sort of specific colors and styles of branding. Again, we assume that they're better and healthy and sure, they might have a little bit less sugar, but the vegetable oil, because nobody's really looking for it and the campaign against vegetable oil hasn't taken off quite like sugar, is that it's still in all the health products. Absolutely. Um, so here in America, we have a store called Whole Foods uh, that has like this healthy glow about it. They use canola oil. They use sunflower oil. They use soy oil. They sell soy oil vegan mayonnaise. And, and, you know, those are definitely not healthy, but it's all gotten a free pass because, like I say, the American Heart Association has played, has had a very heavy hand in influencing all of nutrition thought, not just in America, but around the entire world. And they have yeah. tragically exported 
you know, the thought that these oils are healthy. And now we're, whereas these oils were mostly coming from America in the 1950s, soy oil, that America was the leading and almost the only producer of soy oil, almost the only, um, in the 1950s. Now the entire, almost every country produces a lot of soy oil, or if it's not soy, it's corn, or if it's not those two, it's sunflower. And all of the doctors in those countries are thinking that's a great thing and thinking that when they tell their patients to, you know, get, if you're going to have a burger, make sure to get the lean burger, you know, hardly any fat in there. That is the worst possible burger advice you could be giving somebody. You want that <laughs> natural um, oxidation resistant tallow to be all over that, that iron that's in other highly easily oxidized compounds in there so that your, your meat and your, your burger is healthy the way you expect it to be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, really painting this picture of why we need to steer clear of them. And I think as well, people then, you know, they hear conversations like the one we're having and they kind of give up as well because it can be so overwhelming, you know, like it's like, well, what is healthy, Maddie? It's a, and I actually caught up with a friend last night who said, who listens to the podcast and they said, Maddie, I'm at the point where breathing is going to be a crime soon. Um, mm -hmm. Like, you know, how do I actually do health in this super, super toxic world? So it can be frustrating to navigate because once you know, it's like the burden of knowledge, right? Yes. But I, that's why I think it's so important to understand that oxidative stress is what kills us because mm -hmm. then we should ask, okay, so this and that thing is, you know, not good for our health. How powerfully does it promote oxidative stress? And then we can build our little, you know, um, toxic don't eat list from the top mm -hmm. down and start with the, where you're going to get the most bang for your buck, which is at the top where vegetable <laughs> oils live. Um, and, and so that's why I say, you know, vegetable oils are the worst of the worst. Now, sugar, well, we didn't really talk about this, but, um, but I just want to touch on it. Sugar is addicting. Um, and so it has its own issues with making us overeat it and foods that it is in. But mm -hmm. again, it promotes disease related to oxidative stress and something called glycation, yeah. which is accelerated by oxidative stress. So we can still look at this lens of everything, look at everything through the lens of oxidative stress. And I think that is the simplest way to create my don't eat list, right? So mm. I put vegetable oil on the top, sugar's next, um, you know, refined flours are right up there with sugar. And then, mm -hmm. you know, protein powder um, is, is, is number four. And the rest of the world is more or less, you know, so much harder, so, so much harder to avoid. And you get so, so much less. I mean, the rest of the mm -hmm. world of toxicity, right? Where we've got the, um, the, you know, the fungal contaminants and we've got the, um, the industrial uh, fertilizer contaminants and we've gotten the, the issues where there's toxicity, you know, pesticides that are sprayed on our foods and all this kind of thing. All of those are present in smaller amounts and we don't build our bodies out of any of that stuff. So they cannot possibly have the same potential to harm us as the stuff we do build our bodies out of. So let's focus on the, what I call the, the you know, the toxic macronutrients first. And of course, the worst of the worst of the vegetable oils. And they, yeah, they, fantastic. But where we talk, where sugar plays in here, some good news for folks. If you want to read chapter four, of, if you have a sweet tooth, read chapter four. You could read it first. Um, mm -hmm. Wait, maybe it's chapter three. Yeah, sorry, it's chapter three. Chapter three talks about how vegetable oils make you a metabolic sugar addict. And then chapter mm -hmm. four explains how that drives your tastes. So that if you have a sweet tooth, like I did, um, your part of it is not you. Part of it has nothing to do with the sweetness per se. Um, a huge part of it has to do with the fact that your metabolism, when it's damaged by vegetable oils and oxidative stress, you develop a metabolic need for extremely high amounts of sugar in your diet, specifically really so that your blood sugar can always have a lot of be higher than normal. That is an abnormal state that drives sugar addictions in a, in such a powerful way that it will totally, when you avoid vegetable oils, 
and you control oxidative stress better, you will still have to use some willpower to avoid sugar, but your willpower now has a fighting chance and it, it doesn't until you can control oxidative stress. Yeah, amazing. On the note of that book, uh, where can everybody find you online and how can they get their hands on Dark Calories? Because it's such a fantastic book and I can't wait to buy the physical copy. So I've got that too because, you know, I'm, I'm Kate Shanahan fanboy over here. <laughs> thank you, Maddie. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. No, I mean, really seriously, thank you for your support. Um, it, it really helps. Um, so please visit my website, everybody. It's drkate.com, D-R-C-A-T-E.com. And please scroll down to the bottom where you can sign up to get my monthly newsletter. Um, I will only bother you once a month with what I think is very important information. After a short indoctrination sequence where I get to know you, just about four or five emails where I ask you some questions. Um, and that way you'll stay on top of uh, like any new um, information, like uh, new discoveries that I've come up with. You know, I have to say this, um, you know, you're probably like this yourself, Maddie, like, you don't like saying things that just everyone else is saying. You like to always probably look for the new thing and say something new. <laughs> uh, for sure. That's like a fault. That's why I only have newsletters once a month. But I don't like my newsletters aren't saying things that like are already out there and I'm just kind of rehashing it and saying something. It's brand new information. Seems like, you know, for the, like at least the last couple of years, every single time I put out a newsletter, it's like, no one's ever said this before. Um, so, you know, it'll be uh, fascinating if you're into fascinating new practical pieces of information. Amazing. I will put all of those links down below for everybody to jump into your world, sign up to the newsletter, get the book, highly recommend dark calories, highly recommend deep nutrition, personally influenced my life significantly. The work that I do with my clients, anyone listening to this episode that's been a client will hundred percent be like, Oh, now this is like Maddie in the other version. <laughs> 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 um, but I want to I want to get you to come back so we can have the protein conversation Great. at another time. Um, but just to finish up, of all of the amazing information that you know, what is one piece of health information that you wish more people knew about? Yeah. So, I mean, other than seed oils, I guess I would have to say that um, traditional people, meaning pretty much everyone, 200 years ago, before the industrial era, when the majority of people lived on farms and were food self-sufficient, had so much nutritional wisdom that if we just emulate the way they cooked by basically looking at cookbooks that were older, that are older than, you know, I say 70 years old, mm -hmm. that is a recipe for health. I mean, no pun intended, actually. Um, those recipes are a recipe for health because traditional, traditionally, before this whole wacko idea that cholesterol clogs our arteries, oh, wait, it's saturated fat, oh, wait, it's small, dense LDL. Before any of that, people ate what people had always eaten. And because of epigenetics, that is what we need. We need it now. We needed it then. We need it now. So there's a whole Beautiful. world of delicious cuisines in old cookbooks. Fantastic. Kate, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate the work you do, the time you've spent here with me today. And I know that everybody listening is going to have blown their own minds and want to sign up to your newsletter and get your books. So thanks so much for your time. Well, thank you very much. It's been fun chatting with you. I know no worries. We'll catch you soon. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>